Hey everybody, and welcome to ARE Live. I'm Chris Hopstock, Architect Education Specialist here at Black Spectacles. I'm excited to be your host for today's ARE Live. We're going to go through several mock exam questions from the Programming and Analysis Division with a focus on sun, wind, and light in honor of the summer solstice. We'll be joined by internationally licensed architect and assistant professor Omar Al Hassawi to discuss the sun path diagram, how to design with the sun in mind for daylighting and passive heating, and how to use the wind for passive cooling. If you're joining us for the first time, Black Spectacles is the first ever NCARB approved online test prep provider for all six divisions of the ARE 5.0. Our test prep materials include video lectures, practice exams, quizzes, flashcards, and virtual workshops with a variety of membership options available for either individual architects, firms, AA chapters, or schools. If you're curious about how you can get your whole firm on a membership and have your boss pay for it, go to blackspectacles.com and head to our pricing section. I'll share that link in the chat. We're also the first test prep provider to offer an ARE guarantee. If you use our expert membership to the fullest and don't pass the ARE, we'll pay for your retake. I will share that link in the chat with more info on that as well. And on top of all that, we're releasing new study materials all year long, uh, including section quizzes, which are now available for all six divisions to help you pass the ARE. Over 500 quiz questions are now included with any Black Spectacles membership. Black Spectacles is also expanding its offerings to help architects thrive throughout their careers beyond test prep and software learning. You're invited to join Spectacular, the only professional network built specifically for architecture and design. Create your profile today and showcase your work and explore our curated collection of crowdsourced projects from around the world. I just shared that link to sign up for Spectacular in the chat. Be sure to tune in to our next ARE Live broadcast on July 14th, where we'll review a number of questions from PCM, PJM, and CE, uh, and we'll go over some classic math that you might come across on the ARE. Um, we'll cover products um, such as firm financials, updating cost of work estimates, and reviewing applications for payment. I'll post the link to register in the chat box in your GoToWebinar control panel. Or you can go to go.blackspectacles.com forward slash ARE dash live to sign up. Today we will be engaging exclusively in our online ARE community. So head over to that thread if you haven't already. Uh, you can either click the link I just shared in the chat box or find it in the ARE live section of our ARE community homepage. Everybody who posts in our thread today will be eligible to win a free Black Spectacles t-shirt. So head over to community.blackspectacles.com and just say hi. Don't forget to stay tuned until the end of the podcast to see if you won. I shared that link in the chat box and you can find it in the episode description if you're listening after the broadcast. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our special guest, Omar al Hassawi. Omar is an assistant professor at Washington State University's School of Design and Construction and holds a Doctor of Philosophy in Design, Environment, and the Arts. He's an internationally licensed architect in Bahrain and Jordan and has practiced architecture in the Middle East for nearly seven years. So welcome, Omar. And with that, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you for having me. And thank you for all the good work uh your organization is doing for the architecture community and preparing them for the exams really appreciate it yeah, yeah of course we're so happy to have you thank you so without further ado let's uh, jump right into it uh the first question uh, i'm gonna read it out and then we'll go into some uh, key items in each question uh, and go through those and then uh, answer each question so question one, an architect is designing a new library and plans to use passive heating and cooling strategies throughout the design. During their site analysis, they located the sun path diagram for the area. What is the approximate azimuth and altitude of the sun on the summer solstice at 11 a.m.? Okay, so uh, some uh, key characteristics of the sun path diagram that we see here uh, first of all, this is uh, considered what's called an equidistant sun path diagram, uh, projection uh, from above, uh, looking at the sun path 
uh, in a top view. Uh, the reason why it's uh, considered equidistant is because of the spacing of the circles offsetting from the center are equal uh, to one another. Uh, another important characteristic is that this is for a northern hemisphere um, location because the sun is moving north, south to west uh, versus in the southern hemisphere, which would be the opposite. Uh, the, the, the delta between the highest and lowest altitude angles uh, is always going to be 47 degrees when we look at these sun path diagrams. So basically, the curves spanning uh, east-west on this diagram, uh, the closest to the center is going to be the highest sun angle. The farthest away from the center is going to be the lowest sun angle throughout the year. And those, the delta between those two is always going to be 47 uh, degrees because of the Earth tilt and and the declination angle, which is 23.5 degrees. And the sun points, uh, or the Earth tilts towards the sun uh, in summer in the northern hemisphere uh, by 23 and a half degrees, and away from the sun by 23 and a half degrees in the winter. Uh, making the total 47 degrees. And so those are some key characteristics when we're looking at an equidistant sun path diagram to keep in mind. Now, looking at the question, there are uh, four uh, items we need to understand clearly in answering this. Uh, number one is the azimuth, and the two is the altitude, and then uh, identifying where the summer solstice is on this curve, and then the time of the day. So let's go into each one of these. The altitude angle, uh, which is basically the circles offsetting from the center and space that uh, 10 degrees increments. And this is the angle between the horizon and the sun position above the horizon. And the center of the circle is basically 90 degrees uh, altitude angle. And the outer circle is the zero uh, altitude angle. And everything in between is increments. At 10 degrees. The other uh, key characteristics that we need to understand is the azimuth. And basically, those are the lines radiating out of the center and spaced at 10 degrees increments as well. And this is the angle along the horizon between the projected position of the sun and the true north or south. So on this diagram, you can see if, if you look at the south uh, direction and move either to the left or the right, you can see there are 10 degree increments uh, for those radial lines uh, going in either direction. And so that, those, those, the circles basically represent the altitude and the radial lines represent the azimuth. Now, uh, the months of the year or the date is the other uh, key characteristic that we need to understand here and how to identify. It. And that would be the curve spanning east and west on the diagram. And so the curve closest to the center uh, represents uh, the uh, when the sun is highest in the sky uh, or the summer solstice, which is today, uh, June 21st, uh, longest day of the year. The curve farthest from the center represents when the sun is lowest in the sky or the winter solstice. And like I said earlier, the delta between those two curves in terms of altitude angle is going to be 47 degrees. So once you know one of these angles, you can know the other. Um, the curves in between each represent two months of the year. So uh, January and November uh, are represented by the Roman numeral one, uh, February and October, Roman numeral two, March and September, the equinoxes, as number three, April, August, number four, and May and July, number five. And that's because the sun path uh, across the sky is symmetric uh, throughout the year. And so that's why it's not necessarily that we need to uh, list every month here. Uh, it's, it's known that they're uh, symmetric to one another. And so that's the third characteristics, the month of the year. Now, what's left to know is the time of the day, and that is the curves spanning north-south between summer and winter solstice on the diagram. 
and each of these curves represent an hour of the day. And what's really important to note here is that the way this diagram is, do is drawn is to represent solar time and not clock time. Uh, so what refers to here as 11 a.m. will not necessarily align with the time on your watch or clock. Uh, this is because of the Earth rota rotation around the ecliptic is not uniform, so it moves less rapidly when it's further from the sun. The solar time is about 24 hours plus minus 15 minutes. Clock time is always 24 hours a day. So if this chart was drawn with the time represented as clock time, then the curve would represent what's known as an analema shape or something like an infinity shape, which is what you would see if you recorded the sun position in a photograph at the same time uh, on your watch uh, and at the same location throughout the year. You'd get some something like an infinity shape, which is not what we see here. We see uh, at noon, you see a straight line uh, along the south and north axes. Yeah, that's because this diagram is recorded according to solar noon. And there are ways that you could calculate what the actual clock time is using uh, simple equations or an online calculator that would help you identify for that date what would the actual clock time be. Okay, so now that we know these uh, four parameters, where, where they're located on the diagram, we can go ahead and make the selection. Uh, so what we'd need to do is enter the diagram by first selecting the east-west curve representing the month of the year. And so in our case, uh, the question is asking for the azimuth and altitude of the sun on the summer solstice. So that would be then the curve closest to the center. So once we enter that curve, then we move on and intersect, intersect that with the north-south curve representing the time of the day. And so the question asks for uh, azimuth and altitude at 11 a.m. So we would intersect that with the 11 a.m. curve, exactly. And thank you, Chris. And then at that intersection point, we uh, can read the angle right there, exactly. So we see that in that intersection point, uh, the azimuth angle is between 60 and 70 degrees, and the altitude is between 80 and 70 degrees. So what that means is exactly. So we have the 80 and 70 and then 60 and 70. Perfect. So if, if we look at the options we have in the question, uh, first, option A, azimuth 77 degrees, altitude uh, 48 degrees. So that immediately doesn't fit within the range that we have outlined. Okay, so that uh, option is eliminated. Uh, option B, uh, 70 degrees azimuth and altitude 80 degrees. So these sit on the upper and lower edge of the, of the range that we have. Uh, so that means that that also doesn't qualify because our intersection point sits in between um, uh, the range that we've identified. Uh, option D, also because the azimuth is outside the range uh, as well as uh, the altitude, then in that case that uh, option does not uh, qualify for the answer, leaving us with option C, uh, 65 degrees and altitude 74 degrees. And so with the process of elimination, we can see that uh, we can immediately eliminate the incorrect options and go with the correct option. Thanks for that explana explanation, Omar. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Um, and I, I think just one thing I'll mention here about this diagram is you, you might see it drawn in a, a couple of different ways on the actual exam. You know, you might, um, for instance, see these months not spelled out as Roman numerals, but they might actually spell out the name of the month. Um, they might continue writing the, the times of the day here across the uh, the afternoon times. Um, you know, it's and and I guess my point is not to uh, not to fret over those different graphical representation representations of this. Um, what, you, what you really need to focus on for the exam is understanding what each of these lines mean 
and um, understanding how to read this diagram no matter how it's presented to you on the test. So yeah. with that, yeah, let's move on to question two, which covers the same diagram. All right. So question two. On the same project, the architect is interested in understanding what time the sun sets at various times of the year so that they can plan for exterior lighting. What time does the sun set on the autumn equinox? Okay, so uh, similar to the previous question, the, the, the key parameters we're trying to understand is the time of the day. In this case, they're not asking for the uh, altitude or azimuth, but the time of the day and uh, the date of the year is the autumn equinox. Okay, so the same principles apply, just like Chris mentioned uh, here, the same principle uh, for the chart applies here. Uh, so we enter the diagram first by selecting the east-west curve representing the month of the year. So in this case, the autumn equinox, uh, which is uh, when the sun is exactly above the equator at 90 degrees, uh, day and night are equal in length, September 22. That would be, uh, and and we like we said, September or Mar and March are symmetric to one another. So we would go and enter the uh, Roman numeral, the curve with the Roman numeral number three. Uh, so yeah, entering that curve. Now uh, the time of the day is sunset, and so similar to what we had talked about earlier is that. Uh, when the azimuth, or sorry, when the altitude angle is zero, that's when the sun is is rising or setting, and that would be according uh, to this diagram, the outer circle uh, of this diagram represents sunset. So it, we would extend all the way to the end of where the altitude is zero, and that intersection point with the intersection of the north-south curve. Uh, would identify the time when sun sets here. So in this case, we see that it's at 6 p.m. Uh, solar time. And in that case, uh, if we go through the selections, uh, 6 p.m. would be uh, option C. Uh, option uh, A and B, of course, uh, fall before sunset and option D uh, beyond sunset. So if we extended uh, that line, it would be at nighttime. So those those all uh, do not qualify for the answer. And so pretty straightforward, uh, just to, to keep in mind is uh, sunset is at the outer edge of of this of this circle and and its intersection with the time, uh, the vertical line spanning north south would be where we identify sunset in this case. Yeah, these, uh, these, are, these are two questions that are pretty good examples of uh, how you might be asked to use these diagrams on the actual ARI. And, um, uh, you know, the, the concept of solar time versus clock time is, is obviously super um, important and interesting in practice. Um, I will say that for, for the exam, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't get wrapped up in that and start wondering if I need to add or subtract 15 minutes based on uh, what I'm seeing on this chart. I would just um, read the chart for what it is um, and and answer the question that way. Exactly. Yeah, I think uh, I, I, those equations are uh, there's other equations that are used to calculate uh, the relationship between the two and just to understand the way this diagram is graphed is is solar time and you can just by graphically looking at it you can tell that it's it's solar time because of these lines the curves going north south are are uh, a vertical uh, along the north south axis uh, straight uh, along the north south axis at solar noon so all right well now that we've got our uh our full understanding of how to, uh, how to understand the sun's movement through the sky. Let's move on to question three here, which is about uh, still about the sun, but about a little bit of a different uh, take on it. Right. And uh, this question really focuses on uh, uh, master planning, uh, massing configuration. And so let's read this question. An architect is working on the master plan of a multifamily housing subdivision in the southwestern United States. The project will consist of nine blocks 
of three-story townhomes, and the developer wishes to incorporate a mix of wide and narrow streets in the master plan. Which of these arrangements make the most sense given the project hot, arid climate? Okay, so uh, we have four layouts here. Uh, important to understand, a few characteristics that are important to understand is uh, the, the building typology and the region uh, in hand and the climate characteristics of the region in hand. So uh, for this building typology, uh, what, what we need to really understand about it is whether uh, the building is internal load dominated or skin load dominated. And what we mean by that is internal load dominated buildings is where majority of the heat gain uh, or cooling demands are coming from the inside, from the equipments to occupant the lighting, and a typology uh, that applies to this type of, of uh, load gain uh, would be for office buildings. Whereas uh, skin load dominated buildings where heat gain and cooling demand is coming mainly from the outside and residential buildings are primarily skin load dominated where surface area to floor area ratio is much higher. And uh, solar exposure in such typology becomes really important to keep in mind. And so in this case, it's a multifamily residential uh, the typology here, residential, predominantly uh, skin load dominated, it becomes really important to understand the relationship of the vertical surfaces to, to the uh, elements. And the second characteristic is to understand the climate region we're in. And uh, the Southwest has been a region I've been uh, involved in. I uh, studied there for many years. And what you witness in that region is very high dry temperatures uh, and uh, solar angles are relatively high. And in the west uh, where the sun sets, those are low and also high temperature times of the day. And so those low west angles are also critical to keep in mind to uh, try to uh, work around and have those have a little to uh, or less impact on on your design. Uh, wind breezes at night are uh, also a significant uh, component for this uh, climate. In urban areas, less so, more so in the outer areas uh, in the outskirts of the city. And so, depending on the context, that that has an impact. And uh, one key massing idea to keep in mind when working. Uh, on massing uh, master plan with multi-units is having the long edge of the building span east-west and the reason that becomes uh, significant is because it helps in easily providing shading on the majority of the outer vertical surfaces when the sun is highest in the sky mainly uh, late morning to uh, early afternoon and we can use for shading in that case uh, vertical uh, um, or a, sorry, a horizontal uh, surface shading device uh, to shade all the windows uh, on the long edge of the building. And so a smaller shading device for the glazing elements uh, facing the south, uh, considering the long edge facing south, uh, while allowing for solar access in the winter. So what that helps with uh, in section is that the lower sun angles in the winter for passive heating will come through, whereas the higher uh, summer to late summer angles will be shaded by that horizontal shading device. And so those, those are the key ideas to keep in mind uh, when looking at these layouts. Uh, tilting, the, tilting the massing away from the west sun also helps minimize exposure to the harsh low afternoon uh, sun and uh, allow for uh, maximizing the exposure to the co cooler morning sun. It also helps provide shading uh, to the outdoor spaces between the buildings when sun is highest at solar noon, uh, covering uh, both streets spanning north-south and east-west. So if we took, for example, uh, option D that Chris has drawn on, if we, if we uh, took uh, a drop shadow of this massing at solar noon, you're going to see that streets going uh, north west to southeast and south west to north east those streets are all going to be shaded yeah uh, by this configuration and that also helps 
uh, provide better micro microclimates on the outside and in the surrounding of the buildings. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful diagram, Chris. <laughs> that, that describes it pretty nicely. Um, okay, so now looking at the options, um, uh, now that we know all these characteristics that we've talked about that we need to keep in mind, uh, long edge oriented east-west is ideal. So in that case, we can eliminate option B first because uh, the spacing between the buildings are equal versus uh, what the question is asking for a variety of spacing. And such such a layout would potentially be uh, more uh, adequate for a humid climate um, to allow for airflow, better airflow between the buildings. And same with option C, which uh, seems to prefer airflow over uh, solar access. Uh, in this case, and also potentially for a humid climate. Uh, option A also could be, I mean, having the long edge facing south directly could also uh, be an option to take into consideration. However, um, the, the thing with the staggering of the massings could potentially be used uh, more for a wind block approach, where if the prevailing wind uh, directions in the winter are coming from the north, for example, uh, that staggering could help block airflow in between the uh, the massing uh, of the community you're creating here. So uh, versus uh, shading. So uh, I think you know option A. You know, as the question says, which of these arrangements makes the most sense given the project's hot air climate? So it's not as if option A uh, is is not incorrect, but it would make more sense to go with option D in this case, because uh, option D uh, prefers uh, or favors uh, shading um, and solar access and uh, versus uh, option A, which uh, also has to do with uh, wind flow, unwanted uh, wind flow through and between the buildings. Um, yeah, I would say uh, I would say option A. Uh, well, it's not a bad uh, solution in a in a hot, arid uh, climate like the southwestern United States. It's it's definitely not the uh, the best answer for this question. It's it's probably more applicable in a cold region where you're really worried about blocking the winds. Whereas um, you, you might want to be able to take advantage of some of those winds for cooling in in a, a hot, arid climate. Um, so so that's why I would consider that answer wrong and you know there there are definitely going to be some questions on the ARE that uh, will will ask um, which of these is the most appropriate or what's the best answer to this question and as as frustrating as some of those um, questions can be um, you know it's I think architecture is about making uh, you know informed decisions and, and making the best decision a lot of the times it's not always that there's a perfect solution to every question you'll experience in practice so um, I do think those types of questions are appropriate and um you know if you've been if you've been reading through the uh the ARE resources you'll recognize uh some of these types of diagrams from the book uh sun wind and light um where you can read more about this topic um about what types of massings make sense in uh different types of geographies and and I, Omar I think you had something to do with that book um <laughs> you want to talk about yeah. that a little Correct. Yeah, we're uh, working uh, right now, uh, uh, three faculty members, uh, including Mark Decay, who's uh, one of the current co-authors on the current version of Sun, Wind and Light, to develop a version tailored, a, a version of this book tailored to the uh, Middle East and North Africa. And basically uh, looking at the different strategies outlined in the book, identifying what's most appropriate for that climate region, which is mainly hot, arid, hot, humid and uh, uh, reworking the examples in the book to align with examples that exist in that region. Uh, so uh, really good uh, resource, uh, to uh, really good source to look at um, and very uh, clear in terms of the organization, depending on the strategies. Yeah, that's um, great. You have to let us know when that's, uh, when that's available. Yeah, that's going to take some time. We're still in the proposal <laughs> phase, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a really good uh, uh, reference, as you mentioned, Chris. Uh, 
Yeah. One one uh, tip also uh, along the lines of this question is in terms of the spacing between the buildings. One might ask, okay, so what what are uh, some recommended spacings in relation uh, to the section uh, in terms of height of building to width of streets um, where, where we're taking sections that that span uh, north south. Um, uh, according to studies that have been done, it's 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 recommended that in a in a region that 32 north latitude, so something similar to the U.S. Southwest, is to have uh, the spacing uh, behind the building 1.25 the height if you want partial solar access in the winter, and 1.5 if you want full solar access in the winter. So the uh, the street on the yeah exactly so that'd be about one and a half uh, the 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 spacing or 1.25 if you want partial uh, access to the building uh, to the left of the section that just uh, Chris drew uh, so 1.25 partial solar access for the middle building uh, full solar full solar access would be 1.5 and if we go up north that spacing would be uh, uh, bigger and so for a climate such as Seattle in the northwest and north 44 north latitude approximately uh, equates to a city like Seattle that would be about two and a half the spacing for full to two between two and two and a half for partial and full solar access so uh, yeah, I think uh, I think that's really good information, and it it's um, it, it brings up another point where if you if you see one of these um, types of questions where you're getting all these plan diagrams that you have to analyze, um, maybe if you you know maybe you think better in section or in 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 3D or something, and it might just be helpful to um, try to think of it that way and think uh, you know if you don't know the answer to this question right off the bat from your studies, um, try to analyze it a little bit and um, think about what the sun would be doing in um, the region that's being spoken about in the question, and um, try to try to arrive at your answer that way, even if even if you don't know it. Yeah, great point. So let's move uh, let's move on to question four. All right. So question four: An architect is designing a new two-story kindergarten wing on an elementary school in the northeastern United States. The client wishes to include an outdoor playground in the program and wants to be able to use the outdoor space as often as possible, even during the cold winter months. After studying the site's microclimate, the architect has determined that the prevailing winter winds come from the north of the site. How should the architect propose to arrange the building and playground? Okay, so Again, uh, looking at the key uh, parameters the question is asking for, so we have a two-story kindergarten wing that's going to be added, also coupled with a with a playground. So we need to understand the relationship between those two uh, spaces that we're creating here. Uh, the climate uh, is a, a northeast climate, so meaning that uh, cold winters, uh, cold winds, and uh, Based on the intent uh, of the design, the architect wants to have the playground be used as often as possible. Um, or sorry, the client wants to have the playground be used as often as possible. And so uh, looking at the prevailing winds coming from the north, we need to, uh, in this case, uh, try to relate these two masses to the mass and the outdoor space to one another in a way that uh, kind of provides solar access, which is extremely important in the winter whenever that's available, and uh, prevent those prevailing winds from the north from uh, accessing the space. Um, and so what that means is that we need to have this new kindergarten wing potentially act as a windbreak for the cold winter wind and uh, have the playground on the opposite side of that wing. And so let's look at these options one at a time. So the first option is saying the classroom to the west with the south sloping roof, a playground directly to the east of the classrooms. So if we look at this in floor plan, you have uh, the 
the playground to the east of the classrooms, the classrooms on the west. Now, uh, uh, yeah, beautiful sketch, uh, Chris. So what we're seeing here is that if if the prevailing winds are coming from the north, they're just going to flow right through that playground, and uh, the uh, the classroom building uh, or the kindergarten wing is not going to uh, have any effect on protecting that outdoor playground. So option B, whereas option B has the classrooms on the east and a west sloping roof directly and the playground directly to the west of the classrooms. So it's kind of a reverse of, of, of this. Uh, so classrooms to the east, a west sloping roof, and the playground to the west. Still, prevailing winds are just going to flow right through the playground. You can see here, and so uh, you know the including the slope of the roof in this case, in these two uh, options, uh, does not really have an impact on uh, what the what you're trying to achieve for uh, for the design intent. It's still whether it's sloped to the south, whether it's sloped to the uh, west. It's 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 it still doesn't have an impact on. Uh, blocking those prevailing cold winds uh, from the playground. Option C, uh, the classrooms to the south with a flat roof, playground directly to the north of the classrooms. Uh, so again, uh, the prevailing wind direction in the winter from the north flowing directly into the uh, into the playground, and the uh, kindergarten wing is uh, not really helping with uh, with uh, kind of acting as a wind windbreak for that classroom building leaving us with with option d where the classroom is to the north with a north sloping roof and playground directly south of the classrooms and this would be uh the most uh, appropriate option here because in this case you have the winds uh cold winds flowing from the north uh approaching the uh, kindergarten wing first and then having the uh, playground sit uh, opposite to that. So uh, uh, being protected uh, by the uh, kindergarten wing and in the wind shadow of that building. So uh, in this case, option D would be the appropriate answer. Just by doing these simple sketches and uh, walking through each of the key points of the questions, you can identify uh, what, the, what the correct answer is. Yeah, thank you for that explanation. Um, the the other thing I would say here is this is somewhat of a long question, and the, the answer choices are also um, a, a little bit long. Um, so when you're reading a question like this, you you kind of you could get lost in the information, and and you might lose sight of uh, what is this question really um, trying to get at. So I find the the underlying underlining method uh, that we used here to sort of um, pull out the really relevant information to be useful on the exam. But um, another trick maybe you could use on a question like this is take a peek at the answer choices. And um, each of the answer choices here are talking about um, really two things, um, the orientation of the playground um, relative to the classroom, so where each is going to go on the site, and then the slope of the roof. Um, those are kind of the two variables in, in the answer choices. So you already sort of know that you're dealing with an, an orientation issue here and um, I think the last sentence, um, sorry, the middle sentence in the question here talking about wanting to use the outdoor space as often as possible even when it's cold um, and, and the fact that prevailing winter winds are mentioned in the next sentence, that kind of gives you a hint to what Omar was saying earlier about how um, we want to create a wind break here um, and, and really put the, the building uh, in, in the way of the wind um, relative to the playground. So with that, let's move on to our last question here, question five. Great, okay, so question five. An architect is designing a new ecology center in a rural cold area in the Northwestern United States. The site is 200 acres and is hilly. Which of the following is the most appropriate location for the proposed building? A, at the bottom of the north facing slope, B, low on the south facing slope, C, high on the west facing slope, and D, at the peak of one of the hills. Okay, so uh, uh, 
some also key key information that we need to uh, pull out here: cold area uh, and the hilly site. Um, so to to keep in, in mind here is, of course, the climate also is an extremely important characteristic that we need to understand. And we also need to understand that there are different microclimates that exist uh, on a hilly site uh, that we need to uh, kind of uh, align uh, building position in accordance with those microclimates uh, along the hilly site, uh, depending on the region, the climate region. So. In our climate region uh, that, that's been specified here, and the question for us is a cold area, so solar access becomes extremely important, and uh, so and also the location on on the slope of the hill becomes really important, where you know cold air is going to uh, drop by gravity, it's going to pull at the bottom of the hill, so potentially. Uh, not exposed to the cold winds at the top and not at the very bottom of the hill. So uh, in that case, uh, that would eliminate uh, some of the options here that we have. So at the peak of the hills and high on the west facing slope, those those two would potentially uh, not be the uh, best locations because uh, putting it at the top would leave it exposed to the cold winds in the winter. Uh, putting it on the west would potentially uh, lose that access to the uh, solar gain from the south uh, in the winter also when, when needed. And uh, so we're left with two options here. So at the bottom of the north facing slope and low on the south facing slope. And uh, actually uh, assuming that uh, Chris, that the, this is south facing slope. I, I believe the north facing slope A would be on the opposite side of the hill, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, uh, I, I ran out of room here on my slide. <laughs> let me, uh, <laughs> let me, this is going to be a steep slope here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So A would be on that side. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll just draw this backwards for the sake of uh, discussion. Oh, okay, sweet. Okay, perfect. So again, south facing, uh, really important to get that solar access, uh, meaning that, it, and it's it's not at the bottom of the south facing slope. So when you're at the bottom of the south facing slope, that, that also allows for that uh, cool air to pool uh, at the bottom of the hill. So um, uh, uh, whereas on the north facing slope, really uh, solar access there is, um, Minimal, uh, with the uh, being in the in the shadows of the of the hill. So uh, that would mean that option B would be potentially the most appropriate answer here, uh, and uh, the most benefits from placing the building on the hill would be on the on the south facing slope, low on the south facing slope. Yeah, this is uh, this is another question where you you really need to read into the question a little bit to to um, think about the issues that could happen on a, you know, in a cold area, in, in, in this case, in the Northwestern United States, and um, kind of what, what uh, climactic issues you're trying to solve for in, in that region. Um, in, in obviously, when it's cold, you'd like to take as much advantage as possible of the sun to, to get some, some passive heating. Um, so that's, that's definitely the sort of the X factor in answering this question. Yeah. And, and the other thing to keep in mind is uh, having uh, buildings positioned uh, on the peak of the hill or or high on the hill, uh, th those are really more for uh, temperate and uh, climates that really benefit from uh, having wind flow through the building, more of an open envelope versus a, a sealed envelope. So that'd be more like for humid climates, temperate climates. Um, and north facing slope, uh, yeah, I think probably in very extreme hot climates, that's where you want to want to you would want to be in the shade uh, more often uh, than uh, than in the sun. So that, that that would be where you would want to even even in hot climates. I mean, having buildings placed on the south with proper shading could also be achieved. But yeah, in very extreme conditions, potentially the north facing slope would. Uh, would be a would be a good option. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, I've got a couple of questions here relating to, let's see, relating to question three, uh, if, you've, if you've got time for us, Omar. Absolutely. Um, yeah, try to do my best to answer. <laughs> Um, one of the questions is, uh, why would we not use option B here? Um, shouldn't we try to minimize the surface area ratio in hot arid climates? And uh, is it because there's a series of buildings in this condition? So um, I, I guess, yeah, talking about um, balancing the balancing those two uh, thoughts on how to build in a hot arid climate. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, good question. I think. Um, Really, in hot arid climates, I mean, it, it depends. I mean, even in this diagram, I mean, we would really need to study it further and make sure that the volumes in option B and option D are, are correct. If we have both at three story, then in that case, um, the volume would potentially be or would be smaller in option B than in option D. So we'd need to make sure first that the the volumes of the masses are exactly the same that we could, you know, compare apple to apples. But in, in general, you know, generally speaking, you'd really want to uh, build the ideal way to in a hot arid climate would be potentially to build closer and per, buildings to one another and uh, cast shadows on the out so that shadows can be casted on the outdoor spaces surrounding the buildings. Um, and obviously, of course, yeah, minimizing uh, uh, surface to floor ratio uh, is really important. Um, but yeah, that, that to do that, we'd really need to do a further study of the massing option uh, to make sure that they're both the same. We're providing the same volume and the same square footage in each one. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And and that um, sort of information is is. Uh, a little bit outside of the purview of this question, right? We're not given yeah. any um, information on the volumes of the buildings. This is this is purely a planning question. The the other thing I would say about uh, question B from a test taking perspective is just that it doesn't um, it doesn't meet the client's wishes uh, listed in this question of a mix of wide and narrow streets. So um, just from from that perspective alone, I would definitely not choose it on a question that I saw like this, even, even if option B was drawn exactly the same as D, but it didn't have that mix of wide and narrow streets, um, I would, I would eliminate it just because it doesn't, um, doesn't meet the client's program, I suppose. Yeah. Um, got another question on, on this question, um, talking, saying, um, you know, why, why would you want the long sides uh, of the buildings in, in option D, the correct answer here, exposed to the sun? Uh, wouldn't that gain more heat? Um, this person thought that option C was the correct answer um, based on that uh, that idea alone. Yeah, that's a very yeah, very good questions. Both questions. I think uh, Chris, if we can draw a section uh, just of a of a of a wall with a window in it. Yeah. Uh, on the top right corner, so we can. Or yeah, they're perfect. They can describe the concept. So the idea of having the long edge, yeah, it sounds a little, you know, counterintuitive, but really the long edge uh, facing the sun is is um, is easier to shade the glazing on because the sun is higher in the sky along this facade. So uh, if meaning that. Uh, to shade it, you would need uh, a short uh, overhang above the window. Yeah. For, uh, versus if if you yeah. So that would be if if you were to take you know the summer solstice and a few months uh, before and a few months after, you probably need to, uh, you know to extend that shading uh, device that overhang further out. But it would uh, all you would need is a an overhang to shade that glazing. Versus if versus option C, for example, on the east and west, uh, you'd see like the glazing on on that facade, uh, on that diagram, the glazing on those diagrams, we need a lot of repeti repetition of vertical fins uh, to kind of uh, shade that glazing from the low sun angles and, uh, along the west. And it becomes harder to control. And then there'll be also heat gain uh, from that facade versus versus that short overhang on the south. Um, so that's really uh, kind of the, the big idea behind that 
uh, long edge facing uh, south uh, concept here. Is yeah, to try to... yeah, I was just going to say, I think that one comes down to, um, you know, when you're you're making decisions about where to place buildings, these are these are kind of like big time decisions about the project, right? So um, what, what you're describing, Omar, is that, um, you know, yeah, there are some drawbacks to having the long face of the building uh, face south in a in a hot region, but those are um, there's a relatively simple way to deal with that in terms of the envelope design, which we'll get to later and during uh, schematic design and design development in a project. So as as long as you're sort of thinking ahead and you have a way to to resolve that um, that problem that you you know you're going to run into, um, yeah. you you can accept some of those slight drawbacks of of a massing um, solution that you've come up with because you know how to handle them. Right. And of course, there's a lot of other parameters that get involved. Of course, we don't know what the boundary of the site is in these conditions. We're just looking at uh, pure mass, uh, pure uh, layout uh, diagrams here. So, uh, you know, there might be conditions where, and the site uh, dictates that, you know, you have to have a long edge spanning north south. And, you know, th those are conditions uh, architects would have to deal with uh, on a case by case basis. Right, yeah. That would be. Um, I, I was. I was worried somebody was going to look at this question and think, well, how can I uh, arrange the buildings? How are all of these options possible on a site? Because um, you know they're they're sort of different shapes. Right. Um, so it's it's somewhat of an unrealistic in real life uh, question, but it's definitely something you can see on the ARE because the the purpose is to test your knowledge of these topics. Not, not you know in real life you would either be um, surrounded by other buildings or this would be located in a in a totally open field and and those two situations would change the answer but since that information is not provided in the question i wouldn't go about thinking about it too much to to arrive at your answer so that is it for today be sure to tune into our next airy live broadcast on july 14th where we'll review a number of questions from pcm pjm and ce uh, and we'll go over some classic math that you might come across on the ARE. Um, we'll cover products um, such as firm financials, updating cost of work estimates, and reviewing applications for payment. I'll post the link to register in the chat box in your GoToWebinar control panel. Or you can go to go.blackspectacles.com forward slash ARE dash live to sign up. Um, as I mentioned, at the top of the webinar, Black Spectacles is the first and only um, ARI pass guarantee. We're so confident that if you use our expert membership to the fullest, you will pass the ARI. And if you don't pass, we'll pay for your retake. To learn more about how to qualify for the guarantee or to check out individual membership options, head over to go.blackspectacles.com. And I just shared the link uh, to learn more about the guarantee in the chat. Have you joined Spectacular yet? Uh, Spectac Spectacular is the professional network for architecture and design. We build this platform for you to showcase your portfolio, seek inspiration, network with architects and firms outside of your local community, and to help you find your dream job. Head over to spectacular.design to create your free profile and to upload your best project today for an opportunity to be featured on the homepage. I just shared uh, a link to register in the chat as well. Uh, the lucky winner of our Black Spectacles t-shirt is Nanette G. Uh, congratulations, and we will reach out via email to get your size and shipping information. And just as a reminder, if you'd like to be eligible to win a t-shirt, post a question you have about our featured topic in our community during our next ARE Live. And our community is always buzzing. It's not just during ARE Live, so feel free to poke around and see what your fellow architects are up to and talking about. Finally, be sure to stick around for a few minutes to take our survey and share any suggestions you may have. I promise we read every word that you write in and we use them to fine tune our upcoming episodes. Thanks for watching. Yeah, thank you everyone. Really appreciate it and happy summer solstice. <laughs> Thanks so much, Omar. It was great having you.